And that today, all of you that are just joining us online, we welcome you. I've just had the last, just last few moments just sharing my heart with the people that are here. And uh, I don't know about anybody else, but I, I feel him in this room. I feel him in this room. So you're about to join us in worship, in the word. So Lord, we are here because of you. How oh, I love your family. I asked you yesterday, would you help me to love them the way that you love them? Not the way I love them, or can, but the way that you love your people. So Lord, in the midst of everything, would you just pour out your love upon us as we worship? Because worship is actually just a response to love. It's love responding to love. Thank you for those that have gathered with us here and online. Thank you, Lord, for the anointing and the ministry of Jackie and Steve and the amazing team that is here. Because, God, you're positioning us for something so much better. So, Lord, I ask you to touch the people today, our guests, our family. But, Lord, in this moment, we just want to touch you. We just want to tell you how much we love you in worship, in adoration. And so, Holy Spirit, a moment ago, I ask the people to invite you. And then we, I just ask you to come in this room and do your work and whatever that requires of us. Whatever things we need to let go of, whatever ways and patterns and habits and... Lord, just teach us to let go even of old mindsets, old ways of thinking. And so, Holy Spirit, no one can teach God's word like you, and no one can teach us to worship like you can. So we just lift our hands to you, Jesus. We worship you. from our hearts, Lord, from the heart. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Just lift your hands up to him and just begin to thank him. Just lean on your bosom this morning. Like John, your beloved. We don't want to work to worship. We just want to lean. Lean on your heart, God, and just to hear the heartbeat. Let's worship the Lord with Jackie.
song we could ever sing worthy of all the praise we could ever bring worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you yeah let's sing that again worthy worthy of every song we could ever see worthy of all the praise we could ever see. worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you yes Lord we live for you Jesus the name above every name Jesus, the name above every other name. Yeah. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, Worthy. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you, yes, Lord. We live for you. Sure. 
think a lot about that, or especially recently in my life, God has brought me through a series of so many different um, thought processes recently, and some healing, and um, spiritual things, and mental things, and physical things, but, you know, part of what we deal with as human beings is idolizing ourselves, isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah. And um, the problem being that when we stand on ourselves and our strength. That is, that is putting yourself as, as God before God. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? <laughs> anybody understand where I'm at? But um, I know that may have not been that very articulate right there. But it's willfulness. And it's when we have a strong willfulness, um, we have a tendency to not want to follow where he's leading us. And um, it makes it harder to move forward in Christ and God. And
And so this morning as we continue in worship, if you have any, if I have any, I ask the Lord to search me and know me, test me and prove me, and see if there be any wicked or evil way in me, and lead me, O oh Lord, in, what, in the way everlasting. That's from Psalm 139. Psalm 139 starts off with, search me and know me, and ends with, search me and know me. It's the bookends of the examining eyes of God our Father. And so often we get really, really caught up in, um, in, in ministry, in, in the teaching and the preaching that we listen to becomes all about, you know, everything just working out and everything's awesome and everything's going to be great and just do this and you're so beloved and we are beloved. We are so loved. But in the middle of all of that, we need to make sure that our love is being put in the right place. That it's not just self-love. You know what I'm saying? Oh, we are full of self-love. And we need to love ourselves and take care of ourselves for sure. So I know I don't, I don't need to qualify that, but um, he is worthy this morning. He is worthy. He is the rock. He is the one, amen, the one and only, the lover of our soul. <laughs> He's so good. Yeah. 
the glory.
I know there's something in your heart right now. As we sing in this part of this song, day and night, let your incense arise. Right now, let's just lift our hearts to him. And whatever the cry of your heart is this morning, can you lift it before him? Make no mistake, his ears are open to the cry of his people. I called unto the Lord, and he heard my cry, Psalm 46. That he lifted me up out of a miry pit. He set my feet upon a rock. He put a new song in my mouth, and many shall hear it and fear the Lord. What's the new song in your mouth that you want to be able to hear and say, God, I know you did this. Can you lift your cry to him right now? Lift your prayer to him. the cry of our hearts. You are the fulfiller, the sustainer. Day and night. Day and night, Jesus, day and night. Day and night, Lord, day and night consumed by you, consumed by your presence, your love, your grace, the tenderness of your mercy, the beauty of your love. tells us in you we live, in you we move, and in you we have our being. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus.
in all that we do, Jesus, we do for your glory. In all that we do, we do it for your glory and your glory alone. We love you, Jesus. Back in the day, I always used to encourage the people to look up, put your hand on your mouth. Just give them a big kiss. The Bible says, kiss the son, at least he be angry. I would encourage you to kiss him all day long. <laughs> now, before I encourage you to kiss each other, I'm not going to do that, but would you take a moment, turn around, get out of your seat. Now that we have witnessed of our love to God, let us witness of our love to one another. Take a moment. I'm going to talk to the people online. Take a moment. Greet one another. Thank you, Jackie, for being so sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Turn around. Greet those around you, please. Get out of your seat. We are a family. And I thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you for just being on this journey with us. When I tell you the Lord is doing something so very powerful, um, He is. And I am so very excited about what God is about to release to us as a body. Um, what he's been doing in my life these last few weeks has been really overwhelming, uh, scary, yet overwhelming. But it's teaching me to trust him. And so I pray the message today will minister to your heart and uh, that you will encounter the Lord in a new way. And he'll give you a greater hunger for him than you've ever had. So would you please just take a moment, prepare your heart, get your Bibles, and uh, I'm going to open my heart about a, few, a number of things that God has us on this journey and about this journey that we're about to step into with Him. So I love you. Thank you so much. Also, just to take a moment while they're still greeting each other, <laughs> thank you for standing with us financially. Um, it's in the bio, I believe, but... Um, our children's ministry is about to just we're about to add so much more to it and there's some things that we desperately need to get um, and some of the curriculum that they're going to be taught next week beginning next week is is fabulous because I believe in raising our kids up with the Word of God inside of them so we'll be talking about that in a few minutes but thank you so much for praying thank you for giving thank you for financially standing with us because you'll never outgive God. You're not giving to a man nor a ministry. You're giving to the kingdom of God. Thank you, and the Lord bless you. Good morning. Good morning, you amazing people. I want you to... <laughs> for those of you, by the way, for those of you, um, I'm not talking to you guys in here. I'm talking to people online. So, <laughs> But... Um, we miss you, we love you. So many of our people this morning are out uh, in a way either recovering, but we miss you, we love you. We're grateful that uh, I know some of you are watching online. Thank you so much for being so in tune with what God is, with what God is doing here. And um, uh, there's nothing like being home, and, uh, and that means being together. So I wanna get into this. And again, thank you so much, all of you for coming. Um, Again, uh, several people, Mike Nelson texted me this morning, Joe Taylor texted me this morning, it's just, um, and we miss our church family that is recovering and healing. And even though you're not here, you're here, just so you know, uh, and you're here. So the most important thing is you're right here. And uh, I, carry you, I carry you everywhere with me, which bothers me, um, because you interrupt my day so often when I feel like the Lord says, pray for them. And, um, but anyways, uh, I'd love to be able to put into words what God has been doing these last two weeks or so. Uh, but it's, it's honestly, it's almost impossible. And not to take uh, probably an hour, an hour and a half. We are short staffed this morning with our, our team. And, um, but I want to just share a couple of things with you as we get ready. So thank you for your patience. God is so good because he knows like exactly what we have need of. Because if 100 kids would have showed up, like we would have been totally done. <laughs> And, and have no room for them. But um, something that God is doing, and I just want to open my heart uh, to our team who is so amazing and have been so faithful. We're shifting things around because God is changing the paradigm and the direction of where we're going. And so uh, 
Kristen, who's been doing our children's ministry for so long, but also just one of the most faithful volunteers that uh, has been on this journey with me for years, uh, can just, that's her heart, what needs to be done. And she starts to do it. And so uh, we have shifted because this is something we knew we needed to get our worship experience, having Steve and Jackie here is a breath of fresh air for us. Uh, YouTube worship is great, but nothing like live worship, and especially live worship with hearts like that. So we upped our game. Uh, we invested in a lot of things to you know, help you experience that worship with us, with the words and sound system a little bit upgraded. And we're upgrading. I guess maybe that's the word. We're upgrading a lot of things. And... So the next thing we're upgrading is our children's area. And as long as the Lord has us here, I want our kids to have the word of God in them. Because that is the only thing that lasts. It's the only thing that remains is the word of God. And so last Sunday I introduced Brenda Sapp, who now that Kristen has moved from children's ministry to here, um, I'm not sure what that noise is, but... <laughs> Whatever... It's probably a coffee machine. Okay, so we're probably going to invest in a new coffee pot. But, no. but anyways, um, the next area that we want to, uh, I, I feel, a very strong pull to is uh, investing in our children. And the children that do show up here. God is so faithful because our kids' area is very, very small. And we need to upgrade it. until the, As long as the Lord has us here, we want to do our best with the room that we have. And uh, so we're going to be, uh, last Sunday I introduced Brenda Sapp, who the Lord literally spoke to my heart and mentioned her name uh, to reach out to her because of all the changes that I just, this is even today, like this morning as I'm praying here, I feel the Lord just speaking to my heart, like these are preparatory times. This is all preparation for what is about to happen. So we better get ready now. You know, God spoke to, by the way, God spoke to Noah every single day because no one needed direction from God every single day. And so that's where I'm at right now. I feel like the Lord is just every day he's giving me instruction and, and just to change and moving forward. So our children's ministry, Brenda Sapp, who has been, an, uh, she's just, again, a part of our church for many, many years, but spent 14 years in Haiti um, being a mother to a, a bunch of children. <laughs> And so to have her step in and to literally stand on the shoulders of what Kristen has done over the years is a privilege. And so I believe that um, our children, uh, you know, what they right now, they can watch things and that's great. But what they need is the word of God. And so we are investing in a curriculum. In fact, Brenda is uh, she's not here this morning because she's at the church that wrote this curriculum. It is it is this thick. And it's, the, it's God's word for children. And so we are going to be investing in that curriculum for our kids. So that when our kids are here, they're getting the word in them. Because once they get old, that's the one thing that just will not return void. So we're going to add a curtain to help with the sound so that they can be, you know, they, they've, again, it's an open room. So they have to be so, they are, and they're great. They're quiet. Um, and so we want to be able to add a few things. So I'm, that's what I'm asking this morning in our giving, that we just add a little bit more so that we can get this curriculum for the kids. We want the, it is, it's called, I think it's called the Amazing Gospel. But uh, Brenda is actually at the church where the curriculum was written this morning. And she's meeting the people that were, so anyways, when I tell you the Lord is setting things up, he's setting things up. And so I just know these, with all the prophetic words that I've received over the last two weeks, it continues. Last Wednesday night, I want to first invite you to this coming Wednesday. We just have prayer here. It is a, a speaker, a playlist, and an hour of just hungry hearts. Would you, Saru was here for the, I think this was, last Wednesday was your first one. H how did you, what was it like for you? It was, uh, if you can't hear her, probably not. It was really powerful. And I felt the presence of God in here. That he was moving in a different way. So she said, I felt the presence of God in here. And he, he moved in ways that was, were different. Never moved, yeah. yeah, like he's never moved. And uh, that's what prayer does. It's just what prayer does. Amen. 
God, and so I invite you Wednesday night, if you're here, if you can be here, it's just an hour, it's simple, no frills, we get a hold of God, and uh, last Wednesday was, in, it was powerful for me, and I know that everything that God is doing right now in my life is connected to what, what happens here in prayer, Amen. and um, so this past Wednesday in preparation for, I'm sorry, time. Wednesday, thank you, <laughs> at seven, Wednesday is the time. Uh, <laughs> Wednesday at seven. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, because they could show up and yeah, but uh, yeah. So Wednesday Eastern time, if in case. So seven o'clock Eastern. But um, but yeah, it's it's going to be a powerful time. And so last Wednesday, as I was preparing, you know, I was again just prepared, like Lord, where, where where's where's your heart in in all of this? And um, and I came across a name that I'm familiar with to some degree, having done this for forty years. Um, but I wasn't, I wasn't, I, I didn't know it too well. And his name is Phineas. I'm not going to get to him right now, but that was sort of the, the heartbeat for me last Wednesday as we began to pray. And it came from, from, a, from Psalms 106. But before I, I, I get into Phineas and talk about him in, in a moment, uh, in John chapter 21, I want us just to prepare our hearts. And I, don't, I wish I had a good title for this. So I titled it Phineas because I don't know, it just, it's a, it works. Um, but with this title, um, there is a catch on the way would be another, this is where I would want to begin this morning. There's another catch, there's a catch on the way. And what does that actually mean? So in John chapter 21, um, verse 1 through 6, it says, Later Jesus appeared again to the disciples beside the Sea of Galilee. This is how it happened. Several of the disciples were there, Simon Peter, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, Nathaniel from Canaan and Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and the two other disciples. Simon Peter said, I'm going fishing. We'll come too, they all said. So they went out in the boat, but they caught nothing all night. At dawn, Jesus was standing on the beach, but the disciples couldn't see who he was. This is after the resurrection. Verse 5, he called out, fellas, have you caught anything? No, they replied. Then he said, throw your net on the right side of the boat. And you'll get some. So they did. And they couldn't haul in the net because there were so many fish in it. So let me just, let me break this down for you for just a moment. Anytime you see the word right side or right hand, that is God extending an invitation to you. It's an invitation for something greater. It's always an extension for you. He's inviting you into into something that you're not yet familiar with. You're not a, you, you're, you're, you're about to taste of something. So it's, it's always this. So he says to them, you, you, hey guys, have you caught anything? And they said, no, listen, we've been, we've been at this all night long. Then he said to them, verse six, throw your net to the right side, the right side of the boat, and you'll get some. If you look with me, if you will, just follow with me, if you will, at Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. I know it's a lot of verses, but I'd rather read the word than to preach cute things. One day, as Jesus was preaching on the shore of the Sea of, of the Galilee, great multitudes pressed, on, pressed in on him and listened to the word of God. He noticed two empty boats at the water's edge, for the fishermen had left them, and they were washing their nets. Stepping into one of the boats, Jesus asked Simon, its, its owner, to push it out into the water. So he sat in the boat and taught the crowds from there. Verse 4. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Now go out where it is deeper and let down your nets to catch some fish. Master, Simon replied, We've worked hard all night and didn't catch a thing. But if you say so, I'll let down the nets again. And this time, their nets were so full of fish that they began to tear. 
A shout for help brought their partners in, uh, in the other boat, and soon both boats were filled with fish and on the verge of sinking. You don't know what God is up to. You don't know what God is doing behind the scenes. And you can toil all night long. And so my question has, is, is really is, is this. Have you ever found yourself in a situation where you feel like all of your labor is in vain? Have you ever worked like tirelessly and you've got nothing to show for it? You spend years and years and years working trying to get somewhere and, and you, you get to this point, and I saw it, I literally saw it the last three days at a conference where it was a pastor's conference and altar call after altar call was for pastors and discouraged leaders. And when I tell you every altar call that I witnessed, it was packed. The altar was packed with leaders who are discouraged. And a friend looked at me and said to me, You're going to be busy with the ministry God's given you because that's where my heart is to just help broken leaders back up on their feet. And I saw how many leaders and I talked to some, how many of them are on the verge of just giving up. They want to throw in the towel because they're tired. We don't have that option. We do not have that option to give up. Well, we do have the option, but we can throw in the towel. The problem is, what do you do with the call of God on your life? Because the giftings and the callings of God are irrevocable. And that means every single one of you. That's just not me. So what do we do? What do we do when we feel like we want to give up? We want to close shop. Because here's what happens, just like in these boat situations, they're fishing, they're going at it, they know they're doing what they know how to do, and they're exhausted. And they're catching nothing. What they didn't know was there was another catch on the way. And this is where Jesus and our relationship with him has to just go so much deeper than where it's been. Because if we just go a little bit deeper in him, if we just press in a little bit more into him, then what will happen is he has something in store and he may be just really, he's about to surprise you in ways that will blow your mind. Because I'm actually beginning to witness that. And so that was the situation that Peter and his other disciples or his friends were in, they were facing, they labored all night, had caught no fish. And so Jesus borrowed Peter's boat and he used it as a pulpit. And he, and he just, he, 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 and then he invited them to cast the same net, listen, the same net in the same lake. And now there's different results. So let me just say that again, same net, same lake, different results. What happened? Jesus stepped into the situation. And when Jesus steps into your world, and when Jesus steps into whatever the circumstance is, the result will always be outstanding. And it will be more than you can handle, more than you can bring in, so much so that the boat's almost like they're beginning to sink from the catch. So this isn't a, f a faith message necessarily, but there are times when it seems like, you know, we, we, we feel like we failed and we've got nothing to show for our work or our labor. And I, I'm like, this is where I'm at such peace. I'm at such peace because it's not about the numbers anymore. It's not about the crowds anymore. It's not about the money anymore. It's not about the organization. It's not about being the CEO. No, God never called me to be the CEO of the gathering place. He called me to be the pastor. That's where I think pastors will step into places where they shouldn't go. Because the church isn't, it, yes, I understand legally and all the organizational part of it and the, under the IRS and the rules and so forth. And yes, the business and all of that. But no, no, no. The church is a family. The church is not an organization. It's an organism. It's the heart of God. It's the family of God. I wonder, I'm serious. This is just an opening of my heart. I wonder how many churches will remain in operation if the IRS pulls its thing from them. 
It's 501c3. The true church, there was no 501c3 in the days of Jesus. People gave because it was the kingdom. Rather than, you know, the, 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 you know whatever the receipt is that you get. And so I'm looking at this and I'm seeing this is the same lake, same nets, but it's at one instruction from Jesus, different results. This is why when the Lord said to me, July the 13th, I'm going to go back to that. July the 13th, sir, Thursday afternoon, I'm praying for Steve and Jackie because they're, they're going on, on, I know they're going on a ministry trip, and I'm praying over several things, and the Lord says to me, build a place for my presence and my provision will be there. And ever since that day, July the 13th, right around 2 or 3 in the afternoon, that word has shifted my entire, it has shifted my everything. I didn't realize how much my life would shift as a result of that word. Just one. And since that day, it has been word after word after word. But let me just tell you something about, I love the, I love the prophetic. I'm very careful with it because okay, I've been around long enough. It, ooh. Because sometimes people that you trust will become conspirators against you. I'm going to say that one more time. I'll show you that from scripture one day. People that you trust can turn on you and then become your conspirators. Dangerous place to be for anyone. Look at Absalom's life. So we have to be very, very careful. Because with even, and I'm, I'm talking about the five offices, they're good people and so forth, but you don't know the motive, you don't know the intention. So for me, I'm very, very careful when it comes to the prophetics, people speaking into my life, who I, who I allow into a very, very small circle. Because I've been here too long and I don't have time to waste. And, and I, I say this with all respect to everyone. I'm done chasing down people. Because God has been dismantling the people-pleasing aspect of me. And he's literally... So on Wednesday night when we were in prayer, it was just so powerful. I see a human slingshot. Steve, I'm, I'm seeing this as we're praying. You guys remember. And I see a human slingshot. And I see God backing people into this slingshot. And he's releasing. And I'm watching the people like... He's, he's just the trajectory they were, and they were soaring. But what I noticed is when they were soaring, they weren't looking to the, to the left or to the right to look at the scenery. They had their eyes fixed on God, and he, they, like, they were going towards a bullseye. And I really felt like what God is saying is, this is what I'm doing. He's changing the trajectory of our lives. So all these prophetic words, even up to Wednesday morning... I received another one from this dear man who's been such a blessing to my life, Marvin Harrell. And he, he, he calls me and he's like, and he, and he is, I mean, when I tell you, whew, I just want to say there's some true prophets in the world. Then there's ones that think they are. But this man has rocked my world with his humility, with his accuracy, and, and he's not prophesying me with getting a Rolex. He's prophesying the most amazing things that deal even to my children. And I'm watching God in one week, in one week, God did things and began to do things that I just blew my mind as if God is saying, I'm telling you, this is me. Because if I can be accurate with this, then I'm figuring God must be, this, is gonna, this whole thing is going to come to pass. Are you, okay, are you guys here? So if, if, if one thing, I mean, within a week, one thing that is major happens. I'm, okay, God, you've got something in store. So you know what I'm going to do, God? I'm going to keep my eyes fixed on you. And so this Wednesday night, it, it just is, it's going to, I mean, this past Wednesday night, it erupted in this room in prayer. And I think this whole aspect of prayer it's, ch it's changing my life. I mean, I'm approaching it very, very different than I did in the past. And I'm watching God. Un He's undoing. So this, even during this conference, these last few days, I didn't really want to go. I just honestly, I, I've con I'm conferenced out. But I knew God said go. And I'm so glad that I did. 
because I, God did some things in me that needed to be done. But not only in me, I watched him touching leaders from all over the place. And it reminded me that everything that I've been through isn't in vain. And that he will use everything that you're going through so that he can bring you to a place to use you. And I'm telling you, I don't know about your prayer life, but man, mine has taken off. And I'm realizing everything that God is doing right now is I've, I just have felt over the, the last couple of days, the Lord just speaking to my heart saying, if you'll just press in a little bit farther, let me amaze you. You've been casting your net in the same place for so long and, it, you're, and, and, and the, there's no results and you feel like you want to throw in the towel and you want to give up, but I'm telling you, just press in a little bit more. Go a little bit deeper. Let God get you out of your comfort zone and then just let him begin to deal with you. Like Jackie was saying, like, search my heart. Like the whole thing in Psalms 139, it begins with search my heart and it ends with search my heart. And this is where I think I'm just at. Like, God, would you take anything, all the old patterns, mindsets, thoughts, and this, that, that word, by the way, that this precious man gives me, the very beginning of it is God is going to change the, the way you think and your mindset. And that's where it started. Like, that's where the words, and he's like the first, the last five years of your life, and he's talking about the stress and everything else, and God is about to blow it like chaff. Guess what? He began to blow it like chaff. You know what I'm not going to allow? People to stress me out. Come on. Just not going to do it. And he said some stuff and said some stuff Wednesday. And I may share some of it. I don't know. Because I love to, when I share anything prophetically that God is, I don't, it's, it's not, it's, it's about accountability. It's that when I release something that God said concerning me, it's not just for me, it's for us. And, it's, and in that, there's an accountability. Because I want to be held accountable to what I heard. And I want people to hear what was said and then be able to ask a year from now, what happened to that? Yeah. Why, did you, why did you put it down? Why did you, yeah. you know, why did you shelf it? Why did you despise God's voice when he said a year ago he was going to do this? And so this is where this whole thing is just coming alive inside of me because, you know, those, those, there are times in our lives when our weariness can actually cause us to, to doubt God. But here's the truth. God has the final say in every situation of your life. Amen. And when God has the final say in every situation of your life, I want you to know it's not over until God says so. Because God always fulfills his promise. And if God is asking you to press a little bit deeper in spite of all your past human efforts, take him at his word. The reason he's asking you to press in a little bit more or he's saying, hey, I want you to give me a little bit more time, you know, with your life and with your heart. You, you've, you know, you've done this, you've done that, but now I'm, I'm requiring this of you. He's saying that because there is something he's going to do and it's going to require a bit more effort on your part to say, you know what? These things in my life are important, but this is the most important. Because whenever he says, don't give up, I've got the final say. I want you to press in. I want you to go a little bit further. You may be pleasantly surprised because God may surprise you and has a surprise for you in the same environment in which you've worked so hard, where you've had no results over the years, but all of a sudden, that going deeper with God, and here comes a catch. God is about to fill your nets. Your boat will not be empty forever. Your labor will not be in vain. I'm going to say that again. Your labor will not be in vain. So don't give up. God might just have a surprise for you that is going to take you places where you've never been in your walk with him. 
is this, am, am I, is this, and I'm not saying this in a preachy way, please know this. I'm so done with that preachy crap. I, it's not that. I, I want to know, is this resonating with yeah. the heart, yeah. with your heart? Yeah. So never stop appealing to the one who can do what you can't and what others won't do. In Luke chapter 18, I'm going to read this. This is, again, there's, it's a lot of verses, but it's okay. And so I want us just for a moment to look closely at this amazing parable from the master teacher himself. And this is one of the few parables where Jesus gave the purpose of prayer at the beginning. And this is Luke 18 verses 1 through 8. One day Jesus told the disciples a story to show that they should always pray and never give up. I'm sorry, let's say that again. Let's go back there again. Jesus, one day Jesus told his disciples a story to show that they should what? Always pray and never give up. Why is it that we always want to give up on prayer? If the enemy comes after anything, it's to, it's to distract us just from praying. And even when we're praying, we have this ability because we're brilliant. We pray, but our mind is planning the day. We're distracted, but we're praying. But we're thinking about our, point, our appointments today, but we're praying. There was a judge in a certain city, and he said, who, who neither feared God nor cared about people. A widow of that city came to him repeatedly, saying, give me justice in this dispute with my enemy. The judge ignored her for a while, but finally he said to himself, I don't fear God or care about people, but this woman is driving me crazy, and I'm going to see that she gets justice because she's wearing me out with her constant requests. Then the Lord said, learn a lesson from this unjust judge. Even he rendered a just decision in the end. So don't you think God will surely give justice to his chosen people who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep, will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will grant justice to, to them quickly. But when the Son of Man returns, how many will he find on the earth who have faith? And so, if you will permit me, I want to share just a little bit of the word that I received this past Wednesday. But this word isn't for me, because I wouldn't be sharing it if it was just for me. But I believe it's for some of you that are, on, that are watching, and it's for some of you in this room. And I pray that it ministers to you as it ministered to me. And so here was the word that came from this precious man. Marvin Harrell, he called me on Wednesday morning in his country, 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 country accent. He, we talked last, yesterday, we just laughed. He said, the stress that you've been dealing with is not about money. It's about movement. God has to dry up. God has to dry you up so he can take you to another place so you, you can flourish. I did the same thing to Elijah. The people of the city will sustain you. Now, I don't know, by the way, if this is a physical place or a spiritual place or maybe both. He said, if you don't bring them fresh manna, the people will become hungry. God's people are hungry and God has given you fresh manna to give them. I'm going to do the same work in you as I did for Noah. He needed to come to me. He needed to come to me and get direction every single day. God needs you to come to him every day so that he can give you direction because the old blueprints won't work. This is not for me. This is for all of us in this room and for those of you online. And he said this to me, and, this, and, and I, the only reason, again, the only reason I say these words, because these are personal, but they're not just for me. I know that because God already spoke to my heart to share them with you. And this is the next thing he said. He said, the Holy Spirit says, Sam, you don't know how much I love you, Sam. 
And I want to say that to you. This is not about me. I'm so done with the me. This is about you. And this is about your walk with God. And this is about how special you are. So I'm going to say the same thing to every single one of you in this room. You do not know how special you are and how much God loves you and how much the Holy Spirit says to you, I love you. Yeah. And he's saying the same thing to you online. The Holy Spirit loves you and God has great things and we know that God has great things in store for our lives, but it's going to also require for us to lose the old blueprints. And just say, God, I need you to do something new in my life. So I'm going to say this to all of you, whether you're watching online or in this room. The Holy Spirit says, you don't know how much I love you. And if you don't, I believe in, with all my heart, in these coming days, you will. He went on and he said, the anointing on your life is going to intensify. He said, I don't need any more messages. I need Sam to become the message. Understand what you carry. And this is, again, not for me. Understand what you carry. You are carrying life inside of you. Jackie, listen to this. He said, I am building a place for habitation. I want a place where I can abide and not leave. I don't want, I don't want anyone to carry the ark anymore. I just need some place for it to rest. So again, I go back to, you said July the 13th to me in the afternoon, build a place for my presence. He said, what I'm launching you into now will touch the world. He went on and he said, your scars are what qualifies, what, what, what are what qualifies you for this. Show the people your scars. Jesus showed Thomas his scars, not because he doubted, but because he wanted to see something real. Show them your scars. He went on and he said, I'm remodeling you. That's why you don't fit in a lot of places. And that's why you don't wear the suits. Because I just want the person. He said, everything is changing. I tell you today, God is moving in your life. And this is what God is going to do for you today, Sam. He said, today is a pivot day in the kingdom of God for you. I just had a yard sale in the spirit and I'm moving a lot of things today for you. He goes on. He had no idea. He had no idea what was going on inside of me, even on that day. I'm going to wrap this up pretty soon. I believe that God is calling all of us to a deeper place. Whatever that deeper place is for your life, I don't know. But I pray that these words will shape your communion with God. Matthew chapter, Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 8. When you pray, Jesus said, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on the street corners and in the synagogues where everyone can see them. I tell you the truth. That is all the reward they will get. But when you pray, go away by yourself. Shut the door behind you and pray to your father in private. Then your father, who sees everything, will reward you. When you pray, don't, listen, he says, when you pray, don't babble on, on and on as the Gentiles do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again. Here's the words. He said, don't be like them. For your father knows exactly what you need even before you ask him. And I pray that these are the words that comfort you. Let me just show you the power of prayer. The power of prayer. In 1 Kings chapter 8 is a very powerful story. In verses 37, these, this is actually Solomon's prayer. And then I'm, I'm going to go to there, and then I'm going to go to Psalms 106, and then we're done. 1 Kings 8, verse 37 through 40. And by the way, 
the very words that we just heard or read, for your Father knows exactly what you need before you ask Him, these words should change our approach to prayer. He already knows. He's our Heavenly Father who knows everything about you and I. And He's, by the way, He's, he's neither ignorant of our needs nor in need of our encouragement. He just wants time with us. And so 1 Kings 8, verse 37, if there is a famine in the land or a plague or a crop disease or attacks of locusts or caterpillars or if your people's enemies are in the land besieging their towns, whatever disaster or disease there is, and if your people Israel pray about their troubles, raising their hands toward this temple, hear, listen, then hear from heaven where you live and forgive. Give your people what their actions deserve, for you alone know each human heart. Then they will fear you as long as they live in the land you gave to our ancestors. Let me just build on that for just a moment. Tragedy, shock, sickness, trauma will continue to ravage the earth. This earth, as long as it's, it continues and remains in the way where people are just, they're just running from God and all the situations that we're in. A few years ago, we faced a pandemic. And people are still struggling and that pandemic killed a lot of people. Millions of people. Just follow with me for a second. Something so small and unseen brought an entire nation and world to its knees. No one had ever heard of the coronavirus 19. And then here comes all of the stuff that comes with it. The politics and the... When Solomon built the temple in Jerusalem, it was dedicated to worship the living God. And his presence so filled the temple, if you read it, that the priests could not fulfill their responsibilities because of the glory of God that filled the place. And, and so it was this very holy moment. But listen, this is all in that story. Then Solomon knew that even though they had all this amazing visitation from the Lord, that the human, the heart of humanity, the heart of man was still very vulnerable to sin. And so, and so in this prayer, he's pleading with God to hear the, the people's cry of for repentance, to forgive their sins, and then to act and save them from whatever their circumstances were. And, that they're, and so here comes, and so again, we're, we're, they're facing plagues, they're facing uh, diseases. And then Solomon refers to each one needing to bring before the Lord the afflictions of their own hearts. And that's where we have to begin. If we want our prayers of intercession to be empowered by the presence of God and the presence of the Holy Spirit, we've got to begin right there. What you were saying earlier, Jackie, God, you know my heart. And if there's anything in me that needs to be changed, and if there's any, if you see anything in me that you need to remove, I give you, Lord, I'm asking you to invade my life and invade my heart and invade my soul and remove whatever needs to be removed so that you can have your way in me. Now, that is a place, and don't pray that unless you mean it. I close with this. Here's what I encourage you to do. I encourage you to turn every difficult situation that you're facing into an opportunity for prayer. And pray like you've never prayed before and watch God's hand move. And there is so much more that I want to share with you. But I came across this verse on Wednesday that just absolutely did me in. And it's this guy named Phineas. And it was sort of, as I said, it was the theme for Wednesday's prayer time. And so if you read Psalms 106, the whole thing, I think you'll be amazed at the whole, so I don't want to go through the whole thing, but we come to this last, the, the, these two verses in particular. It said, but Phineas had the courage to intervene and the plague was stopped. 
And so, verse 31. So he, was, so he had been regarded as a righteous man ever since that time. Read the story. And what you're going to find is that there is so much misery and there's, there's basically what we read in, in 1 Kings. There's all these, there are all these things happening and God was looking for one man to stand up and to pray. And I think to myself, again, just let me go here by myself. I wonder what would have, what could have happened or what will happen with all that happened with the last couple of years, where were the prayers of the righteous? I, I am putting myself at that altar first because I did what everybody else did. I panicked. But I, I think to myself, man, if one man could stand up and be and have such a connection with God that when he prayed, yeah. a plague was stopped. Yeah. Thoughts? Pretty strong. So when Marvin first prophesied over me on 9-11, I was with him in his home. He, he said these words, and I actually preached about it last week. And he said, Sam, you're always telling God you trust him. But God says, I trust you. And that did me in. Did me in. And I'm asking you the same question. Can God trust you? Can God trust you and I to be one that will stand up in prayer? Can God trust us with his anointing? Can God trust us with his love to give away like we were singing to those around us? Can God trust us with his blessings knowing that as he blesses us, our hands are opened to others? And so we so focus on us trusting God, and that's, yes, oh my gosh, you, we breathe that every day. But I, I've gotten to this place where I've just said, God, I just, if you trust me, what an honor that you trust me. And so now, when I approach anything in my walk with the Lord, when I pray for someone, I look at that and I say, You've, you're trusting me with this. You left 99 for one. When we in ministry will run to the 99 and plead with them to do something. But you sit with the one because you know that one needs you. My, 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 my request, I guess. What would happen if 10 Phineases stood up? What would happen to our nation so that he had, it says, so he has been regarded as a righteous man ever since that time. He stood up and he prayed. So what has God trusted you with? And if God has trusted you with it, that's the power you carry. I know it did something here Wednesday night when we prayed that prayer. When we, I mean, the presence of Jesus was in this room, and I heard people pray like I've never heard that particular, one of them was Saru. Just, when you prayed, I'm like, oh, I don't, I don't know this Saru. It was powerful, Ken, you would have been, whew. But something happened. I, I'm just, I'm guessing, because that, I mean, it wasn't a prayer meeting thing. It was just a God thing in you. Is that, am I, I'm just asking? Yes. Yeah. If that can happen for Saru, that can happen for me. It can happen for any one of us. If we just get to this place where we say, God, 
Jackie, would you make your way up here? Would you mind just to grab the guitar? So let us stand together in prayer, in intercession. Don't ever underestimate the power. You don't have to stand up now, sorry. I'm, I'm saying this as a collective thing. You know, I think that, that, you know, as our nation is in desperate need of, for unity, for harmony, for God to intervene, putting all of our political views aside for a moment, this nation was founded on God's word. People just coming to freely worship God. I wonder what would happen if some of us just stepped into a place of just getting serious about our prayer life. Just not praying over a meal. And that's always good. I've cried out to God so much over the last couple of days. I just want to be a Phineas. You could just imagine with me for a moment, what if every time you prayed, God answered it? Not for stuff, not for, because he, a part of that word that came to me was, he, the Lord's through Pastor Marvin prophesying, he said, God knows what you have need of. He wants to know what do you want. I'm asking you the same thing. Honestly, what do you want? What do you want from God? What do you want in your life? What do you want? And aren't we so good at praying our needs? Aren't we so good at rehearsing the list of when we come to pray? And just imagine for a moment, and you're in that time of prayer, and you're asking God, I need you to do this, and I need you to do that, and I need this, and I need that. And God says, just stop. Don't tell me what you need because I promise to meet it. I've got, I'll supply all of it. I supplied it before you even were asking for it. But now tell me, what do you want? I think some of us would struggle with that answer. But I pray that this is where our life will come to, knowing that he's promised to meet every need now we can actually say, God, you said, if I delight myself in you through your servant David, if I delight myself in you, you'll give me the desires of my heart. I think that's what we want, Lord. Lord, we want to delight ourselves in you. And to be able to get to this place in our life, Lord, where, yeah, we're praying our will, but it's not about that. It's about your will. Because you said, if we pray in accordance to your will, it shall be done. So, Lord, I ask you to stir in us a hunger to press into you through every challenge, through every circumstance. And that you would call us to go deeper. Because I think this is what prayer does for us. It does it in a way that is just, that is powerful and, and protective it's relationally transforming. <laughs> Every time. And each time we pray, we're reminded of 
the context of life, our life. That the context of our life is not a situation or a location. The context of our life is a person. And that person is you. You created everything that makes up our existence. You control every situation and every relationship I'm in. That is who you are. Full of authority. You're above me. You're around me. You're with me. But you're in me. God, you control my entire life. You're the conceiver and the creator. And because you are, you are able to diagnose what is broken and cure what needs to be healed. So Lord, today, I offer you up my life in a new way. Totally surrendered. God, I ask you to raise up Phineas's all over this land, all over this nation, around the world. Men and women who know your voice, hear it, and act upon it. No matter what challenge, no matter the circumstance, God, we say come and have your way and dismantle the old and shape and build the new. God, raise up Phineas's. <laughs> Who can step up? Who can stand up and raise their hands to the God who controls the universe. And no matter the plague or the disease or the situation, they know who they're tapped into. I ask you, Lord, that you would dis just dismantle the old patterns the complacency as Jackie said earlier God would you dismantle the kingdom of self the kingdom that I've made me let me live my life to build yours because you're with me you just stand to your feet for a moment, please? And In Acts 17, 28, it says, In him we live and move and have our being. He 
surrounds you with his love. He bathes you in his grace. He is the context of your life. He is your life and he is the hope of your future. He is your counselor, he is your protector, he is your advocate, he is your teacher, he is your guide, he is your friend. He is the conceiver and the creator. That's who he is. That is who your heavenly father is. I, I don't really don't know what more to say, but maybe for you to take a moment and just lift your heart to him and whatever it is on your heart that you need him to undo and dismantle and just that whole aspect of self and maybe you've lost some of your hunger maybe your commitment to him is just not as deep as it used to be maybe you've just pushed side away because you had a bad experience and a bad encounter i want you to know he is the god of new beginnings and he will restore and he will heal Because in all of your effort, in all your labor, it's not in vain. I want to say that to you again. It, it, no matter how bad it's been, it's not in vain. Because he can take even the bad and turn it for good. Take a moment, put your hands, your heart, more important, put your heart to him and whatever it is that you're asking of him, he's here and he's listening. He's listening. cries of our hearts. This is what we
Lord, I thank you that you said there is nothing impossible with you. That you are the God of the impossible. Lord, I thank you that you look over and you look after. You look after us and all our impossibilities. Normally this is our time where we have our conversation with each other, but there's no more important conversation than the one we have with you and the one you have with us. So, Father, I just pray that you touch your people with a hunger like they've never had before to pray. To build a place for your presence, an altar in their hearts, in their homes. Lord, we will do that here for you. For your people can come and receive of your healing, your heart, your hope for them. And now, Lord, we prepare our hearts to honor your kingdom, knowing that what Paul said is so true. every seed we have you've, you've given to us. And that when we sow that seed that you gave to us, you will multiply it back to us, not back to you. Thank you for being so faithful to us. And thank you for meeting all our needs. And thank you for teaching us to pray our wants. Father, I thank you for what is about to transpire in the lives of your people. The surprises that are about to come their way. They've been, they've been casting their nets, been casting their nets. And you're inviting us to pray and to cast our nets in prayer because there's a, there's a catch on the way. And so, Father, we lift our hands to you and thank you in advance for your promises coming to pass, every one of them, for us, for our children, our grandchildren and their children. Lord, that our lives will be lived out to be fruitful as we build your kingdom. That God, we will leave a legacy behind us with hearts that are crazy in love with you. So thank you, Jesus the way you love us. Thank you for never giving up on us. Hmm. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. I ask you in the same attitude, just not to transition in the attitude in the heart and the atmosphere. We want to honor the Lord and I just ask you again that you would remember to help us so that next week we can have material for our children, 
we want to bring them, get the few things that we need uh, that really just, we don't want it to go into our budget. So this is a, an offering that you can just, you can give online. Um, obviously in this room, there's envelopes we can get to you. But thank you so much for just being a part of our day, part of my day. And uh, I, I pray that your testimony will be even greater than mine in the days ahead and that you will watch God surprise you in ways that you did not expect. But this is but the beginning. Amen? Amen. I love you guys. The offering bucket thing is up here at the table. Just make your way and thank you for joining us and thank you for being a part. God bless you. Have a great week. I love you guys so very much. Jackie, thank you for what you carry, you and Steve. And uh, each of you, thank you guys. Next week, I just believe it's just, it's going to be great. It's even going to be greater. So I will see you next week. Have a great week, everybody. Thank you all for coming to our guests. You're no longer guests. You're now family. Okay? Even if you live in St. Louis. God bless you guys. I love you. Have a great week.